I also want to point out I'm really not nearly as egotistical as it's going to appear uh, because I'm talking about myself and my class and uh, I allowed these good folks here to choose the titles of the talks that I was giving. They're the ones that came up with teaching really large classes very well. I would never say that about myself, but thank you. So I just co-opted the title and stuck it in there so you knew that you were in the right session. Uh, I do teach pretty good sized classes. Uh, the average class is about 600 people, 575 to 600 people. Uh, every spring and in fall is the super mega gigantic class that has become notorious in different academic and technology circles that has uh, our max one time was about 2,984 uh, so close to 3,000 we say 3,000 I round up uh, and I am increasingly moving that to online where we hope that in the future we can reach out and serve an even bigger audience uh, I talked about uh, this in an earlier meeting, th that it's not really about ego with me. Again, I'm really loud and obnoxious, and what I lack in obnoxiousness, my coat makes up for, my jacket. So it's not really that I have a huge ego and I want to teach a MOOC, because I think MOOCs are cool, or I want to have 100,000 people in my class, because I think most of that stuff has been nonsense so far. Uh, I'm really passionate about the subject material. I'm exceptionally passionate about Americans, or all students, but let's call them American students, uh, who are fairly ignorant about world affairs and the world at large. I'm pretty passionate about them not being like that when they get out of college. So I have increased the size of the class, not for me, but because I really want people to know what current events are and be able to pick up a newspaper and be able to communicate with their uh, potential bosses or coworkers about the happenings of the world and get it. That's why I keep pushing for bigger classes. I also like to th throw out the full-on disclosure from the start. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a statistician. I'm not an instru instructional designer. I'm barely, barely a professor, right? The most tenuous thread, you can call me a professor, but that's about it. So I am an experimenter. I completely self-admitted. I'm the canary in the coal mine. We have been attempting to do these things and experimenting with larger and larger classes and all these different assignments to see if it works. Uh, and if it really sucks and uh, students all fail a certain assignment or they all say it sucks, then we don't do that again. And things that do work, we try to duplicate and continue to roll on. So I don't have the academic credentials nor a 75-page treatise to prove any of the things about why this class is great. I'm only going to tell you about the stuff that we've done to try to engage this many people and are going to continue to do to engage even more people by going fully online. So it's a big class that's taught perhaps well uh, with the byline, well, I try really hard to get it in that neighborhood. Uh, this is the class that I teach live sporadically, although I'm going more online. It's in the biggest hall that we have on campus, which isn't even a teaching room. In fact, it's terrible for a teaching room. Terrible acoustics, there is no central air. I usually teach in the fall, so on August 28th, it's probably 100 degrees in this place, and there's close to 3,000 people packed into it, but they show up, uh, so I do as well. And this whole gigantic class experiment came about simply because of user demand. Uh, it is an introductory class in geography. It's called World Regions. Uh, uh, well, let me go back. It's, it's called World Regions. It's a basic introduction to the entire planet in one semester, which is an entirely impossible task. So my real goal is not to teach them a bunch of facts or a certain uh, 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 grouping of knowledge. It's more to try to incite curiosity, uh, get people engaged, to impassion people, to want to continue to be a lifelong learner when it comes to globalizing events and news and understanding mostly their role in the world and their country's role in the world. I, I came to this early on as well. Sorry, I'll get all, all, off this soapbox for just a second to say that I'm personally passionate about this subject and subject material because we live in a democracy. I think you guys in Canada do too. So we live in a democracy and we live in two of the most powerful democracies and two of the most powerful countries on the planet. Uh, what US and Canada decide to do for foreign policy or do in the world affects the entire world. Would everybody agree with that? If you don't, keep it to yourself, okay? 
what we do affects the entire planet. And we live in democracies, which means we pick the people that go do that stuff. And when we watch politics or elect people, 99% of the time, what do they talk about? When we're deciding who to put up as our representatives, they talk about taxes or welfare or abortion or all of these domestic issues. And those things can be important. I can't remember the last presidential debate where anybody actually talked about foreign policy. And what's more important, they rarely talk about it because they know the American population doesn't care. And we elect people that affect the whole world. That's what started to bother me over the years. We need to have a more educated, literate society to put the people in power that affect the entire planet. I know this from personal experience talking with students. Uh, students from other countries have told me this time and time again, the whole world watches the US election, the whole world, with bated breath. And we can't get half the people to even vote. How bizarre is this? And it's because they're disinterested, they're not engaged with it, they don't care. So that's why I become passionate about the topic is, you, we in this country, in this continent, affect everything. You, it's, I don't think it's an option. I think it's mandatory, you must care. Your policies and the people you put in office affect everything. It's your damn job. From a moral standpoint, it's your job to know what your government is up to, what, how it's affecting the planet, and a day-to-day -day knowledge of world affairs. That's why I'm fired up about this class and why I try to push it to more and more people. I think that passion comes through, which is why the student demand for the class has continued to grow. I've been teaching it for 15 or 20 years, and it started out just like any other class with 50 or 60 people. Uh, it's just a general geography class. It's a thousand level class of no great account, I guess. It's in the geography department. But more and more people be, started to migrate to this class and be interested in this class and word spread. So we went, uh, after teaching it for three or four years in a class of 50, we jumped to a classroom of 550, which is the standard big classroom. And then the user demand kept going up. So six or seven years ago, we had uh, 550 people sign up for the class in a waiting list of 3,974. And I said, this is preposterous, uh, so let's just teach one time in a huge classroom. We'll wipe out all demand. It will probably suck so bad, no one will ever want to take it again, and that'll be that. I can go back to my normal life. Uh, unfortunately, it worked, uh, and the demand has sustained itself. So we must be doing something right, even in gigantic classes, which go against common sense that they would be good, would be personalized, or that people would get much out of it. And so that's what I'm here to talk about is, how do we do that? How can we do this with so many people? And maybe, maybe you can glean some things that might help even in smaller classrooms. So I want to be really forthright. All this crazy stuff I'm going to talk about, you may already be using, you may not be. But it's applicable or possibly a utility for a classroom of any size given this generation of students and how they consume media. So, the technology tools available to communicate and deliver content in today's world are awesome beyond words. We have grown up in this age, so we're taking a lot of this for granted. But try to put yourself a thousand years in the future or a thousand years in the past and think about what a critical age of how much has changed in our lifetimes in terms of information dispersal. We can now find any fact about anything on planet Earth, any time in human history, in one second. We can watch synchronous watch video of people in war on the other side of the planet. I can communicate with anybody on the planet right this second who has a cell phone. This is an amazing time to be alive. And we need to be doing a lot more as educators to incorporate these absolutely fantastic tools for more uses than shopping on the internet. Or fantasy football or calling your girlfriend in Zambia. Those are all great things, but I get terribly excited about, hey, we're the educators. We should be using this stuff to do a lot more that's good for students and for society in general. Uh, however, having said that, uh, I never want uh, anyone to be forced into compliance, uh, nor lulled into complacency. And what I mean by that is, I don't know what you teach. I don't know you all personally. I don't know your class size. I don't know your content. But if you are a five-star rated professor and students love you, 
you're doing fine. And you don't use Twitter, you don't use anything, you're doing fine. I don't want anybody to ever adopt tools because there's a tool to adopt. I came into using all these technologies kicking and screaming because I'm a, even though I look kind of youngish, I'm a classic old school professor. I was like, oh, no, no, no. I want to come stand up in front of class and people will come from miles around to hear me spout. Uh, and you will all applaud after I leave and you go about your merry business. That's the life of a professor. How awesome. And that's what university is all about. How awesome. So I was not that big into using Twitter. This is not something that came naturally to me or video broadcasting or any of this stuff. So depending on your level of experience, if you're doing it right already and students still come to class and they're getting what you want them to get, you don't have to adapt anything. Technology is great, but if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. But at the same time, I'm suggesting don't be complacent because if it ain't broke yet, it's going to be soon. And it's not you. It's not you, it's me. Right? It's not you. It's this generation of learner. It's not you. You're still fantastic. You're still at the height of your game. Uh, and you could give the exact same lecture you gave 50 years ago in the exact same way, using the exact same jokes and, and the same mannerisms. And it's not going to work for much longer because people are not consuming information the same ways they used to. And us professor types, the sage on the stage, uh, people used to come from miles around because I have knowledge that you all don't. And if you want to hear it, you must come to me. That's not really that applicable either. I'm trying to think of, and I don't know you all personally, but I'm trying to think of what you know that ain't on the web. And if you know it, how come it ain't on the web? And if you know it and it ain't on the web, is it true? So we have built the whole university system on this concept that, well, there's experts there that you want to go learn from and interact with to get knowledge you can't get anywhere else. And quite simply, that's just not the case anymore. Information is cheap, it's easy and instantaneous. So there's got to be something else going on, some other sort of sharing that's happening in the classroom that makes it worthwhile for you to come engage in. And I think increasingly you're going to have to tweak the way you deliver that information and tweak the way you deliver the interaction. So that's why I started to dabble with this stuff five or six years ago out of necessity of how can I get 3,000 people to be engaged with this stuff and get the stuff I want them to get and feel like they're a part of something. Because if it's simply me reciting a bunch of facts, they can do that online. They don't need me for that. So a few, this is a few general strategies we use for super large classes and are continuing to tweak as we go to perhaps twice as many students, perhaps three times as many students. I don't know. I actually don't think a single human can teach a class of 50,000. I find the, these MOOCs uh, from Stanford and the Ivy League, I'm sure they're fantastic. But you're not telling me class. If 100,000 people are in it and there's one professor in charge, that's a TV show. They may be watching something that professor did, but it ain't a class. They're not engaging with the professor. There's no dialectic. There ain't no back and forth. So you may be watching a TV show, but don't pretend like that's a class. What I'm doing is I've got several thousand people and I think I got a community and I'm willing to double it to see if I can maintain that community and that interaction. And some of these strategies and these tools are helping me do that. So some of these strategies, these are the big picture, big picture super strategies we use to try to communicate and interact and engage with 3000 are number one, increase the bandwidth. Uh, number two, uh, expand the options. Uh, number three, make a class, a group of humans, into a community where the class is the center. Uh, I've never really thought about it. It just popped into my head as I'm talking. You, I want to take 3,000 disparate people all over the place and make them into a tribe somehow. I don't even know what that means. But inherently, I think you know what I'm trying to say, that they have some commonality that brings them together, and in this case, I want it to be about this particular class, or maybe this university, but this particular class for now. So increase the bandwidth, expand options, make the class into a community. First one is increase the bandwidth. I want to attempt 
to communicate in their languages. And I referred to this the last talk as well. Uh, but I really look at these technologies, particularly the communication technologies, as separate languages. I, we grew up and you had to take a French class or a Chinese class or a Russian class. Those are languages. This generation, it's Tumblr, uh, uh, Reddit. If you've never heard of Reddit, all your students have. Uh, if you're not, you're not on Twitter, all your students are. To me, they may be using English, but these are different languages because they speak it and most of us don't. Isn't that what a language is? Some sort of communication device that only the group in it can do it and know it and inherently get the nuances? So for this generation and maybe ones that follow, these are languages that they communicate in that you don't. I'll say me too, that we don't because we're older. These languages didn't exist. And many of us aren't interested in learning these languages, myself included. For full disclosure, when Twitter came out, I thought it was the dumbest ass thing I've ever heard of. It's 140 character, what, what would anyone on planet Earth need this for? And I am not the smartest person in the world, not even close, but I'm smart enough to actually try to keep a finger on the pulse with the youngest generation of students. So enough, I, people know I have an open door policy when it comes to just talking about futuristic stuff and these things. So enough students keep saying, you want to watch Tumblr? Hey, Boyer, you want to watch this? Hey, Boyer, yeah, Twitter's going to be the next thing. And I've around, been around long enough that I know, eh, some things work out and some things don't. But people have been telling me about Twitter for five years before it even was public. Okay, I don't see the utility in it, but enough smart young people are saying they see utility in, in, utility in it, then I'll keep on it. And we stayed on it, and lo and behold, whether you like it or not, it's an international thing that that and Facebook have helped start revolutions in places like Egypt. So this is not something that you can just trivialize anymore. These are respectable, legitimate modes of communication that more and more people are using, particularly this younger generation. So I want to communicate, <coughs> communicate in their language. I may not like it. I don't want to have to learn Russian. But if that's what they're doing, and I want to communicate with them because I'm a teacher, and that's our job? Communication? I've got to speak their language. I have said this uh, many times in the past, but I could be the best world regions teacher ever. And let's face it, I am. All right? I'm the best geography teacher ever. Uh, and if I were to be invited to Beijing University, because they've heard I'm the best professor ever, I, and I get there, and I only speak English, not Chinese, and they only speak Chinese and not English, does it make any difference that I'm the best? It's a complete waste of time. We don't speak the same language. It's a, I, I'm, the, I'm the worst teacher in their eyes, not the best. And that's the way I look at these things. I ain't got to like it. I don't want to learn Chinese, but I get it. So I want to try to at least a bit speak in some of these languages because it increases teacher-student interaction. They're already in these environments talking with each other. I want to tell them, hey, I speak that language. You can talk to me in that language too if you like. If you like. You can come by my office, which nobody does, or you can email me. I mean, just think about that. That's kind of a language that we never really thought of as a language, but now it's standard. And Twitter's going to be that way, and some new thing that hasn't been invented will be the next new hot thing in 10 years from now. So it increases interaction. It also increases student-to-student -student interaction if you create assignments that take advantage or force people to use the languages to do some sort of work. Uh, and it provides instant and continuous feedback. And this is the part that whether you ever want to use this in class or not, doesn't matter. But don't we all do these things at the end of the semester called teacher evaluation, class evaluation? Anybody heard of these things? You guys do that in Canada? I bet you do. Uh, we wait till the end of the semester to ask people if it was good. To ask people if it could be improved upon. To ask people if they get it. We wait till the end to ask them that. Given these technologies, you could ask every second of every day the entire semester. You want to know if something works? Ask. Marketing companies used to spend millions of dollars for market research. Now people are giving them information. They just sit back and reel it in. 
Cool, tell us every customer preference you've ever had and all personal information. And people are throwing it at them. Again, maybe not our generation. I ain't giving them nothing. Uh, I refuse to answer the phone. I ain't doing your survey online. I ain't doing none of it. But this generation, all of it, here you go. So if you want feedback with class, with a, not just did you like the class, did you get this lesson I just did? Do you understand the principles we just went over? If you have a, if you have a avenue of communication, you can get that instantly. You can do it, you can get that while you're lecturing. You can have a feed up on the screen right now that people can write in if they get it while I'm talking. Or you can ask them after class or at the end of the week. There's no excuse anymore for, oh, I didn't know nobody got any of this stuff until they all failed the final exam. Why did you wait that long? There's no, there's no reason for that. We got instant feedback loop. Uh, these amazing and free, uh, mostly free, and new communication tools bring people together. And I'm going to point out a few specific ways, uh, most of which your students are already using. Uh, there are those tools that help students interact with other students. Uh, namely, you can have a Facebook page for your class. Your department probably has a Facebook page. Uh, you can have uh, different user groups on Facebook. They're quite savvy now with your students being able to sign up to create whole spaces dedicated to interacting about your class. I'm not actually a big Facebook fan. It's starting to lose its luster. Uh, but Twitter is a big one as well, where students communicate with other students uh, about what's happening in the class. There's something called a hashtag you can use that's specific to you or your users. Uh, I actually use online forums uh, for different exercises where students have to talk to each other about class content. Uh, even if you don't do it as an assignment, what we have found recently is that so many of this generation are so online that they ask us, Where is the where's the class forum to hook up with other students? I just got asked that for the first time this semester. I was like, oh, I, you, you do that? And they said, yeah. Where do we go to digitally find other students and start study groups? Uh, now, maybe some of you are looking at me like, that's, he's so full of it. That does not happen. Students asking to form study groups? It's new to me. I assumed they all kind of just did all this stuff on their own. But now we see that actually it's our role to facilitate that in a digital environment. And guess how much it costs to do it? Nothing. And guess how much time it takes? About five minutes. So why wouldn't we facilitate students interacting with students uh, to get together for any number of reasons for the class? Or just to ask questions about trivial stuff. Or perhaps to form uh, groups where they actually interact. Uh, and of course, now doing it more and more digitally as well with video. So we see a lot of people who form study groups. Again, we see these, this because we have such huge numbers. In a class of 20 or 30, I don't know that students would do this, but we have so many, we see great variation of, of activity and behavior. So people can even now, of course, do video chats with each other. And I've jumped into video chats with students. For the, again, the low, low price of nothing. You got a question? Well, sure, I'll answer that online. Uh, I did this for the big class to help that kind of interactivity between the students, but also between me and the students. Uh, and we've also, I showed this picture uh, just last uh, lecture I gave, we find that uh, I record all of my videos and they're online, and we find that more and more people are getting together to watch the videos together in their own little study groups. And what's fascinating about this picture is that it's actually just cropped. It's actually four people deep, all watching me on a screen and helping each other. And it's at the library. So they're going to the library to watch a video. Uh, we also have been told uh, a great story I just got a couple days ago from a, an RA said, oh, yeah, uh, this group of students, this whole hallway of students that I'm the RA for, all of them are in your class. They all go out for ice cream on Sunday uh, uh, evening, and then they come back and take over the common room and all together watch your video, and then take notes and help each other with the quiz. And I think, <laughs> yes, I was almost welled up a little bit with tears. I'm like, awesome! That's exactly the type of behavior that we think we want students to do. So are they cheating? I hope so, because it sounds delightful. By all means, interact with each other. If this digital uh, way of consuming media makes it easier for you, then do it. Uh, you don't have to come see me at this exact time in a room. You can do this on your schedule, and it seems like that student groups are breaking out and doing that naturally on their own, thanks to these technologies. 
Uh, there's also uh, uh, technologies that help connect me, me, a single person, with 3,000 or per, potentially 10,000 students. Uh, so yes, I have a Facebook page. I don't really use it to interact so much as to present one-way information. So notifications, class notes, yes, I'll send an email. Now people actually want me to set up a text messaging service for the class. Things evolve so quickly. Uh, and I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll bother you any way you want to be bothered about what's happening in class. So I have a Facebook page where I'll post stuff, but it's more to uh, uh, create that interactive sense of, I, 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 know, I feel you. I don't see you. You're not here in front of me, but I feel you. So I'll just say, hey, we just took this exam. How did everybody do? I'm not that interested in their responses. I'll tell you this. Don't tell my students. I'm not that interested. And it's not about me. It's about they have a space they think I'm looking at that they can then comment. And you have 29 people commented on this. They didn't have to. It was not for a grade. It's a for nothing. It's an avenue of expression of interactivity that people feel like they're communicating with me. There's a more important one that we do. <clears throat> I actually have done this live, by the way, with a hashtag, World Regions at Virginia Tech. That's our hashtag. I did this presentation, in, a similar presentation in Singapore one time. And just for fun, we did a live feed. And I had a Twitter feed going. And I was streaming the lecture. So I was on the other side of the planet, streaming a lecture live that people in Virginia were watching. And then I said, if you're watching this uh, to demonstrate to these people, tell me something you learned in world regions. And from roughly 13,000 miles away, in synchronous time, people started tweeting back and it popped up on the screen. It's like a magic show. It's like, it would have been better, it couldn't have been better if I pulled a, a rabbit out of my hat. People were like, oh my God, this stuff really works. And I'm like, yes, it's not all students. It's not all 3,000 people, but it's some of them are so tied into these different languages online, you can communicate with them in a variety of ways. Pretty much 24 seven, somebody's out there. And I don't know if you've gotten this yet, but I get emails at 3.30 a.m. I get people who say, I tried to take the quiz and something messed up at 4.30 a.m. I mean, we're moving towards this kind of continuous 24 seven service type of, of situation for the class. And I'm not happy about that, but I want to, provide that flexibility that people feel like they, you can't ask me a question and you can take the quiz at 3 a.m. I don't know that I'll get back to you, but I, I'm trying to present the, this idea that, yes, we're part of this together on the same team. The best way, if you did nothing else besides one tip of, of uh, what I'm talking about today, I would suggest this. And that is uh, six years ago, I went online with office hours. So even back six or seven years ago, I taught a small class of 550. And I've been teaching for 15, 16, 18 years. Nobody comes to office hours anymore. That may be different depending on your specialty and what you teach. Nobody comes to mind. Anybody, does anybody have office hours that nobody ever comes to anymore? No one? You have a few hands go up. Does anybody have office hours that you've got a line at the door every time you have office hours? Okay, I'm not trying to point anybody out. I'm actually, I'm always doing informal surveys to see if I'm on the right track. This is Canada after all, it could be different here. Although I don't think so. So nobody comes to office hours. Think about it, it's almost, it's almost archaic. We're, we're thinking about the old way and we're trying to do a good thing and saying we have an open door policy, you can come talk to me. But it's very archaic. A, a young 18-year-old woman is going to walk through the rain, trudge across campus to go talk to some curmudgeon old white guy in a room filled up with papers that smells like mothballs. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. None of us, of course. I'm not talking about any of us in here. Uh, but that's just not the way that it works anymore. And so when we were ramping up to teach this super huge class, I thought, well, we are required to have an office hour. I don't know if that happens here, but you actually have to have an office hour registered. Time for the students to come ask questions. So when I thought about that, I thought, man, well, I actually might get flooded with people. With 3,000 people, it's simply a matter of numbers that a bunch of people are going to show up. So let's go online. Let's take the office hours online. So there's actually several different uh, uh, devices you can use now. They're all free. Some of them now put commercials in, but there's always a new free one around the corner. So once a week, it's Monday nights for me now, I get online and I video broadcast myself live. This is just from my office, just my computer. 
No special equipment. Just click rec record and broadcast. And I'm there to answer questions. People can email me questions. They can Google chat me questions. They can phone in questions. But I'm there to answer questions in a standard online office hour that's in digital. The first time we did this, 895 people showed up. Almost 1,000 people showed up for an office hour. And I was, well, we kept seeing the numbers jump up and people in the chat room were going crazy. And I'm old. I can't keep up with all that flow of text. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you have a question, you actually have to email me. I can't read that fast. And what the hell is going on here? Do you really have questions? And people initially were like, no, I just wanted to see what this was. This is cool. Uh, no, I'm on the bus right now watching this on my phone. This is cool. No, can I seriously ask you a question? This is awesome. And then people actually started asking questions. So lo and behold, here's an avenue of communication that all of us have our office hours that are completely under, if not completely not utilized, but you put them online, you make them available, it's flexible, people can do it from wherever they want, and they don't have to trudge across campus in the rain and suddenly people show up. Again, this was for no credit. They're not getting points for this, but they're coming anyway. And that's when it actually occurred to me, something's different about this generation. They consume things differently. And if you put your content where their eyes are, then a lot more of them will be likely to embrace it or engage with it. This is completely not mandatory exercise, and people still show up. It's not the lecture. It's not even course material. It's extra. People show up because it's in their language. If you did nothing else, I would, I would dabble with this just to see if you get people to come in. Now, in a class of 20 or 30, maybe you only have one or two, and then it's awkward. That's the awkward cocktail party where only one person shows up. Uh, but with the numbers we have, it's like, oh, no, we'll, we'll always get a good turnout. And then we, it genuinely turns into a good conversation where someone's going to ask me something about the, uh, the Hong Kong protests. And then I can answer it. And several hundred people get to hear the answer instead of one person in my office uh, asking. So to me, it's the epitome of everything that's good about technology and education. You're utilizing it for everything and you're sharing additional information that everybody can uh, jump in on and ask questions and access the professor. And what this does, whether you believe in this or not, it creates a powerful, powerful perception of availability. You'll see in caps, in all caps, perception of availability. I'm actually not there that much. I'm not. I'm not that much of a technology geek. I still am warming up to Twitter and all these other things. But if I tweet every now and again, if I post something on Facebook every now and again, I do my office hours once a week. I try to answer questions when I see them. But there's this perception, because I speak their languages, that I'm, I'm omnipotent. And we do, we do the end of the course survey, and we ask people stuff. And, and this comment kept coming up of, I love this class because Professor Boyer is always there. I can always ask him a question anytime I want. And so we built it into the survey. We're like, do you think Professor Boyer was available to you as a professor, even in a huge class, to meet your needs and answer your questions? Everybody's like, yes. And please comment, oh, he's always there. I can ask him a question anytime. And the next question is, did you ever ask Professor Boyer a question? No, I never did. Never. But I could have. I could have. Uh, it's all perception. It's all per simply because I'm in those environments, sporadically in those environments. And it's always funny. I'll, I'll let you in on this tip. It's so much fun. You've got ahead of you. I've already experienced it, so I can't do it twice. But the first time that you pop into a digital conversation somewhere where a bunch of people in your class are in, they will freak the hell out. And it's hilarious. Us old, stodgy professor types, if you jump into a Twitter conversation with a hashtag that a bunch of your students have, they'll be like, oh my god, the professor's here. The guy is here. You're actually here, and it, it actually changes the behavior. And it's because they're so used to that being their space, even though it's public, that they would never consider that you would be there, much less use it as an avenue for communication or education. So you have that to look forward to. Uh, all right, there are also tools that uh, give students a voice during the class. So when I teach the class live, and actually I'm starting to do this online as well, uh, there are lots of things, including a live Twitter feed. 
So when I've taught the big class, I'll have a screen over here where uh, people actually in the class can make comments and they'll come up on the screen. Yes, they have to be edited. Yes, we have someone who oversees them and edits out bad stuff, but uh, people have a, even in a huge class, they have a voice. Uh, more importantly than say making comments is, um, or ans asking questions, is that we have used things like Poll Everywhere. And there's about 20 of these services now uh, where in real time on their phones, they can vote on stuff. And again, these are great technologies. Everybody's got a cell phone. Why not utilize them? So I will be actually live lecturing and say, okay, well, I, I got like three or four topics I'd like to talk about today for current events, but I want to know what you all are most interested in. So would you like me to talk about Russia and China veto uh, moves on Syria, the Assad regime, Turkey and the Gulf states, or a, a, a explosion in central Nigeria? You all vote and people pull out their cell phones and it tabulates it, uh, I think, 10 times a second. And it goes up into the wired world and comes back down on the screen. And actually, it tabulates and updates every half second. So you can see what people think right there and then. And then the fun thing is, is that most people won't participate. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, most students don't do. They're too cool for that. Unless the category that they want starts to lose. And then it's competition. And then everybody starts to vote. So it's kind of fun to watch that happen, that if everybody really wanted Syria and it started to lose and China starts to win, more people will start voting, which is why I think we actually should implement this system for uh, presidential elections all the way around. If you all knew your guy was going to lose, I bet you'd vote. So this is live, real-time response during a lecture, but I can also do this in an online class of, Okay, what would you like to see today or tomorrow, or what would you like to talk uh, to, with me about in office hours? And I'll approach that first when I start the office hour. Uh, so increasing the bandwidth, I do want to stress, and I, I kind of already have, so this will be short. Your students are already at, interacting in this space, and they are likely sometimes interacting about you. So you can actually do searches for your own name, uh, or the word professor, or astronomy. And you can do it geographically. So I could do a search right now in a one mile radius and see all the tweets about any of your names on this campus. You could do that too. Uh, I've done this live as well. Whenever I showed this in Austin, Texas, a whole group of people started laughing and they said, we're in the astronomy department. We know the guy they're talking about. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and it may not always be good either. We just did a word search uh, when I did a talk in New York on professor. Uh, and you have people who are grammatically checking what the, lecture, what the professor is lecturing about, someone who's in love with their history professor, uh, someone who's mad because their professor remembered their name, uh, and Emily Balmer down here, OMG, this is the third week of the professor talking about this project. Enough already. If people have questions, go to office hours. That's a good comment. That's a comment I wish that professor had seen. I'll bet that's a comment he wish he had seen. That's the power of instant feedback and this stuff that's already out there live. And again, I didn't do this here because I like this university so much, I didn't want to embarrass anybody, but you could go search your name and you might see stuff that you'd be like, wait a minute, hey now, I don't want that being said about me. So I actually think professors uh, should be in these communication avenues for quality control and reputation control, if nothing else. Uh, students all know everything. I said this in the last talk. Every test you've ever given, every written test you've ever handed out, it's online, all of them. The one you gave last year, it's online. I can get it, and I'll find all the answers to it, too. Uh, every lecture note you've ever passed out, it's online. You ain't got to hand them out anymore. They got them. There are websites dedicated to this stuff. And students know if you're a good professor and if you're a bad one. They already know that you're hard and you're easy, that you will put people to sleep talking-wise, that you're a great professor who speaks really well, but the class sucks. They will, all of it's already out there. They're already giving you feedback. We're just not looking at it yet. We'll wait till the end of the semester and ask them then when they're already done and they don't really care that much. So this instant feedback stuff, I think, is really good. And it's especially things like this. This is when I got the fun stuff that I'm encouraging you to do. If this would have been me, I would respond to Emily Balmer and say, thanks so much for the feedback, won't bring it up again, and watch her pee her pants and be contacting you within five minutes. Because even though these are all public, 
devices, students, this generation doesn't understand public. They've grown up so much in it, they don't get it. So it's like, oh, if you make fun of me and people have cussed me out and said, this class sucks and he lied about this, and I respond and say, I don't think I lied about that, but I'd love to talk with you about it. Oh my God, you saw that? Yes, it's called the internet. I can see it. So getting into the conversation helps you understand the way they're thinking can dispel bad information and may help guide where you go with lectures and content and things of that nature. Sorry, I've waxed po so poetic. This is one of my favorites I found recently. This is a student depicting himself in class is what it says. Me in class. Do I get bonus points if I act like I care? Uh, plenty of comedy will also abound about you and your class as well, depending on how many students that you uh, uh, lecture to. Uh, strategy two, yes, I finally am getting to strategy two. There's only three, so strategy two uh, is uh, flexibility and lecture content, uh, uh, availability, uh, accommodating different schedules. And I talked ad nauseum about this last lecture, so I won't do a lot right now. But going on, teaching 3,000 people, but also increasingly going online, I started to record uh, more and more of my lecture materials, and now it's one of my goals to record everything I've ever wanted to teach any, about anything ever uh, because it makes it uh, much more flexible for the users, and that is this generation of students, because they consume so much more in their hand. So I, I can lecture twice a week, and hopefully they'll show up. Because if they don't show up, then they didn't get the notes, and then they fail, and if they've missed this part, then they can't get the next week, and the whole thing starts to unravel. If I record it, you can watch it anytime you want. Didn't get it? Watch it again. Still don't get it? Watch it a third time. That's the beauty of video. And as I suggested to the last group, I would heartily encourage all professors to record your lectures in their entirety in case you ever get sick. It's online, you can go, uh, you get sick, you go out of town, you got a conference to go to, it's okay, lecture four is already online, you folks can watch it and see how many people do. So it's a great backup, but also I think everybody should record themselves uh, so you can critique your own message. You can see, did I really say that? That's not what, I didn't mean to say it that way. Uh, if you start using more and more of your uh, content as video lectures instead of live, you, you have the standardization that you know that all the students are seeing the same thing all the time. And if they all consistently fail this section of the physics test, something must be going on with that section of the lecture. It can't all be just them. And if it happens across semesters, now it's time to tweak something. Something's not right. Because I think I'm saying things in a certain way. We all lecture from our own head. I know what I'm telling you. You get it, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean you do. Uh, and if I'm live lecturing, I can't remember what I said that day. I can't remember what anal exact analogy I drew out. But when I record it, now I know what they saw. I can go back and try to tweak. Uh, I also suggested it's great for posterity's sake. Imagine that you have uh, your entire class online in a video format. Uh, your grandkids can watch it. Your great, great grandkids can watch it your great, great, great grandkids could see what an awesome professor you were at the turn of the 21st century. From the grave! Uh, and possibly, if it's such good content, you can put it online, which I do, for anybody to watch it. And we want people to be smarter about what we're passionate about, so why limit it to the people, the 30 people in your class? So anybody can watch it. If you want credit, you've got to come to this university and take my class, but if you want to be smarter, why, why shouldn't we all put it up? We're supposed to be the specialist. Why not share that information? I think we're supposed to do both. So flex, uh, flexibility in lecture content allows for people, students, to watch it on their schedule. So I'll lecture two hours a week, but it's recorded. You can watch it on Sunday night at 1 a.m. You can watch it on Wednesday morning. I don't care when you watch it. And Oh, you were sick that day? Doesn't matter to me. You missed class because you were sick? That's fine. It's online. Your grandmother died for the third time? That's fine. You can watch it on the way to the wake. It's fine, all right? It's up there. It's available for multiple uses. Uh, and I say it accommodates different schedules, but it accommodates yours as well. Uh, I won't get to the end of this lecture because I never do, but I should throw in this disclaimer. It is a tremendous amount of work. Tremendous. And it is awesome in the payoff. The payoff is phenomenal. You record your whole lecture, 
that frees you up to interact with the students more, to go, go on a lecture circuit, to teach from the beach in the Bahamas, uh, to let you do more research. I mean, it is greatly flexible for you, the professor, but actually it's more flexible for them, believe it or not. These students want to watch stuff on their iPad, in the rain, and uh, on the bus, whatever. It's up to them, and they can do that once it's in this format. Uh, it also, I have flexibility in assignments and assessments, which accommodates different learning styles uh, and testing strengths. So in a class this big, I got every major, uh, every academic level, uh, hugely varying degrees of maturity, experience, knowledge base, people coming from all over the place. I think the very first time I taught the big class of 3,000, I had over 100 countries represented. That was actually my favorite statistic. It was people from 100 different countries in this one class. So obviously, just those folks come from varying backgrounds, much less Americans. So I don't know what they know going in. Some of them don't test well. They get nervous on tests. Some of them don't like to write papers. English isn't their first language, so they don't like to write. Actually, even uh, American students where English is their first language don't like to write. Some people don't like to watch international film. Most do. So what I've done is provide a variety of assignments, and this is what I call the flip syllabus that I talked about already, uh, that allows for students to choose what path they want to take to earn the grade in the class. So I have way more uh, assignments than you need to do. In fact, you don't need to do even half of them. Uh, but if you like to write, there's writing assignments. You just like to take quizzes, there's quizzing assignments. I'll give you quizzes on my lecture material. I'll give you quizzes on the book reading material. I'll give you quizzes on flash reading material or just make up new podcasts. Uh, you can watch films. You can write uh, papers, like term papers, if you want. Very few people do. But allowing that flexibility uh, lets people choose their path to earn the points they want. They have nothing at the beginning of the semester. Zero, because they've done nothing. They haven't earned anything. So you have a zero, you have an F. And throughout the semester, everything you do, you gain points to get up to the point level that you want to get your grade. I just call it flipping it. It's no, people, other people have done it. This isn't terribly new, but I'm doing it to scale and it really helps out when you're dealing with this many students because it alleviates all these excuses. I couldn't do this, I'm not good at that, I don't test well, my grandmother died for the third time during the midterm. All of that goes away because I say, that's fine, go do something else. Oh, you didn't do well on that test, we'll go do something else. You don't like to write, we'll go do something else. And it actually takes students a while. They, they, they keep wanting to come up with an excuse, they miss something and I say, I, I don't care if you miss something, just go do something else. People finally get, oh, I, oh, okay, I can just do something else. So it allows us, it affords us a lot of room with not having to deal with student issues. I probably deal with less student issues with 3,000 than some of you all do with 30. Because I bet some, most of you have a midterm and a final. And there's always two or three or five people that can't make that time. So you're already spending time doing something else. I don't. I say, that's okay. Don't do it. Even when they're adamant, but I want to. I know, it sucks. We all want things in life, but you're going to have to do something else. And that's that. And people get on with it. And amazingly, I, I think I've literally saved hundreds of grandmothers from dying because of this system. It doesn't matter if your grandmother's dead. You can do something else. Never heard of anybody dying on my watch. Yes? I actually have gotten away from exams altogether. This is the first year I just stopped giving them. I, I, I found them, for my particular content as an introductory level class, I have found them to be almost trivia games. So I, I can still do it and people actually crave it. it. It's like this innate thing that we must be tested. You must test me. You must give me trivia questions and so I can show you. Uh, and I've said, well, you already have an A. You should already have an A by the last day of class. Um, but in the past, I'm oh, sorry, what was your question? How many people? Uh, in semesters, this is the first semester we've not even offered one. And in the past, probably only 25% of the people actually have to take the final exam. And that's telling you something. If they have to, to take the final exam, they probably ain't going to pass it anyway. Oh, 
no, 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 no. Yeah, I talked about this in the previous talk, but I test in lots of different ways that prevent cheating. Uh, it was a fancier way of saying prevent cheating. Uh, to encourage uh, participation or engagement, something, something, something. Uh, but there's a lot of anti-cheating devices that I put in. And when it comes to online testing, I have a gigantic question pool. So I still give tests online, uh, but they're weekly. And they're on videos and or book readings. And in those tests, I will uh, give you 20 questions out of a possible 200 question pool that I've written. And I'll let you take it multiple times, uh, but you're going to keep seeing new questions. So if you don't do the reading, you just, people sometimes want to cheat and just click buttons and try to get the right answers. They will spend hours wasting their time. If they just would have read it, they'd be fine. When it comes to test, when I did give final exams, they would be synchronous time. So 3,000 people all taking the exam one time, you get one shot at it. It's in this one hour block. You'll get 20 questions out of 300. So you can, you can try to do it with your buddy, but he's going to get 20 different questions than you did. Uh, and there's a threshold. I find the threshold grade prevents a lot of the just trying to click stuff to get points. So for most of my activities now, I say if you cannot achieve over 50%, you don't get anything. If you can't score half, then that's telling me you're just clicking buttons. And I'm not giving you points for clicking buttons. Does that make sense? Yes. I cannot do that. I cannot assure that. Then my, my question is, why would someone else take your class for you? It, it could happen. I mean, uh, and, and maybe it has happened. For money? My, and that's why I'm trying to work on assignments that are so engaging and that the content is actually worthwhile enough that you say, I just want to do this. You're right. You're right. There could be 2,000 people in China taking this class right now for all I know. And that is a huge topic that we do have to consider in the future. Um, we have built stuff in that is enough work that it makes it a waste of time to cheat at it. But it's so instinctual that if you just do the steps, it would also be a waste of your money to pay someone else to do it. You're right, though. If someone is bound and determined to pay someone else to take their class, there's not much I can do about it. But isn't that true in a live class? I mean, if, you're, if you have a small class and you're really stringent and you ID people when you're take, they're taking the exams, then maybe not. But I remember when I was in college, people would run that scam. People would run that, give you their ID, and you'd walk in with their ID. Well, you look close enough. We're both white. <laughs> we got brown hair. I, I've seen people get busted doing that. So when, you, when it comes down to the brass tacks, any system can be gamed. Any system can be cheated. Uh, and I am at the point in my career, may, I don't want to appear that I'm giving up, but I'm at the point in my career that I say, <laughs> if you are going to go out of your way to get nothing out of college, I'm not going to stand in your way anymore. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to try to provide the best class and the best content I can for the people that are here. And my job right now is not so much, what I'm focusing on right, so much right now is not trying to get the 1% to 2% who always want to do nothing and game the whole system and cheat. I'm more focused on how do I get the 50% that don't care that much about this content involved and engaged? We all have the 25% of people, I don't know what the number is, let's call it 25% of students who are awesome. And they're here for the right reasons, and they're engaged in their classes, and they're driven, and they're happy, and whatever. We ain't got to worry about them. Uh, it's the 50 or 60% of people who are floating around that may or may not should even be at university. Those are the ones I'm trying to focus on. The 5% in the gutter who are just trying to scam everything, I think it's a waste of time to try to go after that 1% or 2 or 5%. And that may be bad. You can judge me. That's fine. Uh, but I, I, it seems like I would spend a tremendous amount of time trying to go after 1% or 2% who are bound and determined to not do it no matter what. And I guess it's the old saying, you, you can't save them all. You can't save them all. I mean, even given this system, people fail. People fail. I'm telling you, here are 3,000 possible points. You only have to do 1,000. And people will not only not get an A, they'll fail. You can't save them all. Can't save. Everybody's got different agendas, so you can't save them all.
I am curious. I, I love to see stats on how many people are offshoring their classes right now because you got to think that's happened. Did you hear about that guy who offshored his own job in California? Some people are not. A guy hired a guy, in, he was an accountant, and he hired an accountant in China to do his job for one tenth the price and willingly paid him. He just went in the office every day and hung out and played games. And then I think he bragged about it to somebody. It's the only reason he even got caught. So, yeah, well, there, we're certainly going to have to watch that in, online as we go more and more online. And I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just going to keep trying to focus on quality and hope that you come for the right reasons. Oh, yeah, they're already here, yeah. Yep, uh, has anybody heard about that system? I know there was a company out in California that approached me five years ago when I was teaching this big class so that you pay them money and you go into a computer lab and they have face, they have a can, they have a room wherever where the students, they have a room full of people in California watching computer monitors who are watching people in Virginia on computer monitors take my test. Again, I find that almost semi-comical. I'm like, yeah, I think I'd just rather you cheat. <laughs> And that's another reason why I got, that's actually, both, both of what your, uh, the questions you just made are why I've gotten away from exams. It's, like a, it's a zero sum game that I think puts not undue pressure on students, but it makes it all worth it. And this is why people cheat like mad on the, the Confucian based systems in China and in Korea. People cheat like crazy in those standardized Korean tests. It's a mafia of people who, who scam those things and that's worth big money. So. And it's because all of the eggs are in one basket. And so I've said, no, you if you're going to pay someone to take my class, they're actually going to find out that they're going to have to work and they're going to ask for a lot of money because there's no one single thing that will make you pass this class. You can't pay a human to come take my test that will only earn you a few points. You're going to have to pay a human to be you for three months. And how much does that cost? A hundred bucks. He's already priced it out. <laughs> well, that's why we also do assignments. And again, I'm not, I won't go to all the assignments, but a lot of the assignments we do are, they're uncheatable with the possibility or, or the exception of hiring a human to do them. But the, a lot of the assignments are topical. They're about current events. You have to write something. So at least I'm eliminating the idea that you just grabbed stuff from last semester and redid it or that you have the answer key and you can just do it. Those are the things I'm trying to knock out. Full-fledged human replacement, I haven't tackled that one yet. <laughs> Cloning, I haven't got to that yet. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, what we found, and maybe this is your experience too, that students don't like to write anymore. Have you found that? They don't. <laughs> exactly. They don't like to write. They don't want to write. They have to be coerced into it. So given that my writing assignments are optional, we usually only have about 10% of people that even opt into it. And I, I'm a geographer. I mean, it's a geography class. I, I, I'm not trying to be a writing uh, coach, but I kind of feel like I don't want to get rid of writing assignments because so few humans, at least in our society, even do it anymore. It seems like it's a dying art, uh, and I tell students all the time, you know, if you know how to write, you'll probably be employed, no matter what your major is. Uh, and all the other people with these college degrees that don't know how to write will be working at Walmart. So it's, a, it's like a dying art that we all understand. It's not dying. People, we still need to write. Uh, anyway, the way we grade is we only have about 5 or 10% of people that do certain assignments. When it comes to written papers that have to be turned in, I do usually are, am allocated two or three TAs. So that's the major job of TAs is to assess those things. But I'm also increasingly moving towards peer-to-peer, -to -peer, which I have not been a fan of. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of, yeah, you're a student in this class, you're going to grade someone else's paper. I, I've been dicey on that. But what I have been doing is getting honor students or communications or English majors who say they want to earn more points, I basically hire them as TAs for points in the class. So it's essentially a different assignment. And I'll say, yeah, well, if you're into writing uh, or you want to be a teacher, this is practical experience, you can work on my team and for I'll give you points to grade people's papers. That one I don't have as big an ethical or moral problem with.
because they're there to do grammar checks and do a general content check. I can trust that. They're not really critiquing any grand ideas or if people have gotten a concept. And then there are other assignments like this Twitter assignment that I mentioned uh, where we grade them at the end of the semester because the Twitter assignment is that people pretend to be a world leader in my class. So they pretend to be Angela Merkel of, of Germany or Angela Kirchner of uh, Argentina and they have to actually pretend to be that person on Twitter the whole semester every day. They have to tweet three times a day. Uh, and they have to, everything they tweet or talk about has to be factual and, and important content. So they have to say what the president's up to, who they're meeting with, what their policies are, stuff like that. At the end of the semester, or actually halfway, and at the end of the semester, we can actually click on Plaid Vladimir Putin, our fake account, and I can see everything that they've tweeted all at one time. So it's a silly little assignment. It's 140 characters. What a silly concept. But it's basically one sentence at a time, and by the end of the semester, it's a 20-page paper. So it depends on the assignment, how it's constructed, and how we then grade it. So partly TA, moving more to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, and also some automated stuff where I just look at it. So we only have like 100 Twitter accounts. I can grade those 100 at the end of the semester. And it ain't fun, and it ain't easy, but we we'll try to offer this diversity so that people can do it if they want to. Uh, and I've actually now covered some of this too. We try to create assignments that utilize the online environments that these students already use. So I, again, we always brag about the Twitter because it seems so silly and trivial, but lo and behold, you can write a 20 page term paper one sentence at a time, uh, and it can be used to seek out good news or follow certain uh, people because most presidents and prime ministers actually are on Twitter now. So it, it, it's a funny little tool that has made a huge social uh, impact that can be used for educational purposes. Uh, for those of you still not on Twitter, that's cool, but every journal that you subscribe to, they have a Twitter feed. Uh, every writer and researcher that you respect, they're on Twitter. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just go search it. So I won't say important people, but the heads of fields and industry, they understand this is a powerful medium for communication. They're already using it too. Uh, uh, and a lot of these things harness their creativity and energies. I also do something called the international interview, where I tell for points an American student can go interview uh, someone from another country. So, t and they have to make an audio recording of that, and then we catalog it, and we tag the person's face to their hometown in the world, and that's something that's utilizing all these great technologies, and it's completely hands-off on my point. From my standpoint, they're learning something, and I don't even care what they've learned. If you sit down and talk with someone from another country for 30 minutes to an hour, I guarantee you've learned something. Doesn't matter what it is. I know you've learned something. Uh, unless you sat there and looked at each other for a half an hour in an audio booth, which is awkward. Uh, but we found great success with this because people just start talking about, hey, I learned something about Saudi Arabia. I'm just talking to these people. And that's the kind of assignments and assessments that I like to encourage that utilize this technology and then put it online so that other people, you can go click on any of these people and hear the audio file that our student had with them. Uh, and then finally, strategy three, and if, I, if I'm out of time again, you can stop me, it's all good. Uh, strategy three is make a class into a community and this one, this one actually may be the most important of them all. And this one's the most applicable uh, across all class sizes and all content. And I have to admit, I think it's the most goofiest sounding one of them all. I am not a touchy-feely dude. I am not someone who's wrapped up in psychology and I want students to be happy. I'm not really thinking about their emotional state. I ain't that guy. Uh, but I am starting to understand that it's a very powerful for people to feel like they're a part of something. And especially as we now charge 50, 60, $70,000 for an undergraduate degree, I kind of feel like it's behooved to us to make people feel that they're a part of something. If it's simply about information transfer, they can do that on the web. College has to be something else, and classes have to be something else. Because whatever, you, whatever class you teach, myself included, there's somebody that teaches it better. I, I'm not so arrogant as to not know that. I know somebody teaches this class better than me. I know somebody teaches intro to meteorology better than the people at my school. Uh, do you know that Harvard actually doesn't even have an intro to finance class anymore? Do you know that? They farmed it out. There's a professor in, in uh, Utah 
who's so good, he teaches this intro to finance online, and he's so good, Harvard just tells their students to go to him. And that's the world in which we live. And I think that's cool. I hope to profit from that attitude and behavior myself. I want to work at every university simultaneously. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is that's not building a great sense of community for that class or for Harvard. And so I think it's important that you have students, again, this sounds so touchy-feely, and I'm not that kind of guy, but who feel like they're a part of something. And what does that even mean, building a community in a class? I don't know. I don't study this stuff. I didn't even look this up. Just instinctually, I say any environment where people openly and willingly work with other people with emphasis on willingly. So group projects are usually the bane of classes. I don't know your ex personal experience, but I remember being in college and any time the teacher trotted out a group assignment, like, oh God, do we have to go around the room and introduce ourselves to, oh, this is the worst. And we're gonna get a group of some slacker in it, ah, who's gonna get a good grade, who didn't do nothing. I mean, group projects can be great, but they also have a sense of dread. Uh, so it's not that you force people to do stuff. I'm saying a community is people do it because they want to. People do it because they want to. Because they're going to get something out of it, and they might have something to contribute to it, and they want to. It's going to be good. Whoa. It's going to be good for them. Uh, and it does sound kind of sappy to me, because as I suggested, we're the professors, we're the specialists, we're the experts. Anytime I pull out the pipe, I'm doing my professor face. So we are the experts. You come to us to get this great knowledge. And so it does uh, sound sappy to me, even when I say it out loud. Why would you then bother building a community if you are the one that has not just the knowledge, but the experience and the engagement and that they should be interacting with? Because that's perhaps why they're paying their money. Well, uh, there's a whole lot of reasons, and I call this the TMI slide. I'm not even going to go over this. The TMI means this is too much information, but I always present this slideshows online so you can read all this later if you like. Uh, but students who feel they're part of a community help each other and inform each other more, for starters. They form study groups. They learn from each other. You have a certain level of knowledge, but they're kind of picking their way through it, and they can help each other more. I also like building a, I'm only going to point out this one line up here. It keeps students engaged, interested, and active before, during, and after lecture. Lecture is such a small component of a semester. Think about it. How often do we lecture a week? Standard, two hours a week you lecture? Two and a half? Three? Three hours a week. How many weeks, how many weeks is your semester? Thirteen. Thirteen times three is 39 hours of three and a half months. 39 hours. That's not even a work week. You don't even put in a work week every semester lecturing to a class. And that's the only time they see you, unless you do other activities. Okay? That's not a lot of time. And we expect people to not only get all the stuff we're talking about, but like it, be interested in it, be curious about it. But you're only going to see me 39 hours for four months. So I want to create a community because communities talk to each other more on a more frequent basis. Uh, a college course is holistic learning experience for a whole semester, not for 39 hours. And I'm really passionate about what I do. I've already told you that. I want people talking about it all the time. I want them so excited about my class, they don't go to your class. I'm not even going to lie. I hope they skip your class because they're talking about my class and my content. Uh, I was talking to somebody before this lecture, but I think uh, if I was a university president, a provost, or even a dean for a day, I would hire intro-level uh, professors that were the best in the country. Intro-level. Everybody else can stay in place. But whoever teaches my intro class are the best on the planet. Because I, I would think in today's world, we would actually want a full-on war to try to capture incoming freshmen. And the way you do that is you make them so excited in the intro course, they're like, oh my god, I love physics. Oh my God, geography is the greatest thing ever. I didn't even know. Now, that may be a lie, but you get them in the door so that they are excited and engaged when they come take upper level classes from all the rest of you all. And I don't understand why we don't put more emphasis. I don't know how it works here, but in my university, we're actually a very similar university. Land grant, agriculture, and engineering. It's our specialty. Uh, and our main big intro classes 
or engineering, chemistry, uh, and maybe a couple other things. And they try to fail people out of the intro classes. Does this sound familiar to anybody? So the message is, don't do our shit. It's not, no, you, we don't want you doing our stuff. We only want the best of the best, so we're going to try, and this is what we call them weed out classes. Have you heard of weed out classes? Of course you have. You took some when you were in college. And the whole concept floors me. We want people to come in, and we're so excited about what we research and teach for a living that we want people to fail and not do it. Yes! Uh, I think the intro classes should get people so excited their heads blow up. Uh, and, that, and that's how we're going to get people more engaged in science and math and all these other things. You gotta get people engaged and excited. So anyway, I, I'm sure I've gone over time and I'll get off the TM slide, uh, but in more practical terms, what else can a community do? Uh, community answers each other's questions so that I don't have to answer the same question 3,000 times. So even using things as uh, simplistic as Twitter, somebody using the class hashtag, what somebody asks, what, what's the movie for this week and where is it? Instead of asking me and me answering, somebody else in the class is like, hey, dude, it's next week. It's on the syllabus. Don't you know this already? So communities interact and help each other even with trivial stuff. Can you imagine if I have to answer the same question 3,000 times? Even if I got so pissed off I refused to answer it, I would have to tell people 3,000 times to go look at the syllabus. I don't want to write 3,000 emails to say it's in the syllabus. I let other people do that. It's called the community. Uh, I already talked about our Facebook scandal where people built a Facebook page on how to cheat in Boyer's class. And they were posting answers. And people in a community were saying, hey, here's the answer. Here's this week's quiz on Central Asia. Hey, when did the Mongols do this? And what's the answer for this one? And there was like 785 users in it. And then a student from the class said, hey, professor, did you know people are doing this? This looks dicey. And I went and looked at it, and I'm like, that's hilarious. So I commented on the page, hey, how's everybody on this page doing? Uh, and two minutes later, there were 550 users. And then five minutes after that, there were 385 users. And then 10 minutes after that, the guy who created the page called me in a, in a panic going, I, I didn't know it was going to do that. I, I didn't mean to do that. And then five minutes after that, the page disappeared. All this happened in a 20-minute time period. I didn't do, all I said was hi. The community did all that. They created the environment to cheat, and then they disassembled the environment to cheat. If I had to do it, what a pain in the ass. I'm not doing all that. Uh, community building is not all academically oriented either. Uh, before class, I play international music, and there's several programs out there. And again, this is more for entertainment and welcoming people to the class. Uh, but there's something called turntable and lots of other music out there. So everybody loves music, so I use that as kind of a common tool to get people engaged. And it's not me playing music. All these little icons are all actually users. And the users jump up here. And if they're up here with a computer in front of them, they're choosing the music. So people in the class can sign up to get into this, then take turns playing music. And there's actually a chat box off to the side where people start talking to each other. People make friends with each other. Isn't that all nicey-nice? And while it makes me kind of sick to say it, it's like, actually, that is kind of nice. People met each other in there, and they start study groups in there, and they start talking about music in there. And if that's what it takes to get people engaged in a community, then so be it. Again, I set it up. I don't do anything else. It just goes. I'm not doing it. Same thing with Facebook. I make lots of comments on Facebook. I don't really care what the response is. I'm not going to read every user response, but it gives them a sense that I do care and that I am there and they can talk about things and interact with each other. Uh, and more important, more than trivial things like making people happy or getting them together is uh, when it comes to education, we should always keep in mind that we are the sage on the stage, the, the wizened elder on the mountain. And we spent decades honing your craft and learning stuff. You come at teaching from an exceptionally high level of understanding. And you actually may not be the best person to teach an introductory algorithm of how something works. Because you learned it so long ago, you can't remember the trick. And it's not that you don't remember the trick. You obviously know the algorithm. You understand what it means. But you don't know exactly. You, 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 you're mentally not there anymore. So it's hard for you to approach it the same way that somebody completely ignorant does. So I, it's, it's mostly we sit up on the mountain and throw a line down and hope people can climb a 3,000 foot mountain. 
it actually is more logical that you have teams of mountain climbers who are going through the process all at the same time. Who one of them's here and he's throwing a, a rope down to here and this person's throwing a rope down to this person because this person just got it. They just figured it out and they're like, ah, I see, it's this way. If you do this little trick and that person, then oh, I got it and I'll throw you a rope down here. That's a, a bit more logical way, especially for complex topics uh, and tough material, is that they're getting it for the first time right now and they're a better teacher about that specific thing than maybe you are. This doesn't apply all the time to everything, but it applies to a lot. Uh, and I have personally found this out even when I'm doing this in my own head as I'm lecturing. Is that I'm lecturing about, let's say, let's pick something complex in world politics. The Israeli-Palestinian situation. I've been talking about that for 15 years. I'll be talking about it for another 55 if my body keeps going. And I now know so much about that. When I'm talking, I sometimes have to stop and be like, oh, wait a minute, you people don't know any of this. Because someone will ask me a very poignant question, what's going on right now? Why, why is there something going on in Gaza? And I'm like, oh, well, because uh, there's this, the Hamas group, Israel doesn't like them. And then I have to stop and be like, oh, wait a minute, you don't know who Hamas is. You don't even know how long Israel's been around. You have no idea what Palestine even is. I have to check myself all the time, and all of us do. These people on the mountain just got a little piece, so they're a better teacher than, the, than maybe me at the top. Uh, and it, trust me, I'm, I'm, I think I'm done now, so I, I'll, I'll wrap up. A community also feels comfortable and even compelled to add to the class in ways that individuals do not. So I have a really huge class. I have a lot of people who are interested in a lot of different things. And because of the community, not because I've asked them to, but because of the community, we've had crazy things happen in our class uh, like Martin Sheen and Emilio Estevez that we invited to our course to show an mo international film they had just produced. And we used the power of social networking and the class to compel them to come. Uh, we've had uh, uh, international charitable organizations have sent their presidents to come speak to the class because students have hit them up. Uh, we've had student groups. This is a Bangra group from Kashmir who said, hey, we do this. Can we do this for class? And I'm like, sure. We just did a lecture on India, that's a great idea. Uh, it's a group synergy that can evolve, not just study groups, not just about what you're presenting them, but if it's a good community, then they'll come up with other stuff on their own. Uh, and it's great to see that happen because of the greatest event that I'm most infamous for is that because of students in my class, we actually did a live Skype with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, several years ago, just a couple weeks after she had been released from house arrest in Burma. If you don't know who it, she is, she's a uh, opposition leader in Burma who spent most of her adult life in prison, has won the Nobel Peace Prize, has not left her, ha, at that point, had not left her country for 25 years, uh, much less been seen anywhere. And through the power of this class, the class came up with the idea to contact her. I had several Burmese American students in the class and I just gave them a lecture on the situation. Just a lecture. Then students came up and said, can we get her to, to talk with us in class? And I said, that's hilarious. Sure, we'll invite President Obama at the same time. We have the same odds. Sure, that'll happen. She's under house arrest. She's on the other side of the planet. We're just a class. I was the doubter. And these Burmese students were so impassioned by it because they were Burmese American and they did not even know about their own country. Their parents were so ashamed of it, they never even taught them. So they learned about the situation in my class. They said, we want to contact her. I said, OK. We did one of these things we called a shout out video, where I just turned the cameras on the crowd. And I said, hey, you should come visit our class. Anybody cheered? Then these Burmese, and I said, OK, now everybody social network it. Use Twitter and Facebook to pass this video along, to network it out, to make it go viral, which is a terribly trivial, dumb thing our society does, unless you use it for good. So we're doing, we're trying to make something go viral so that it's a good ending that's educational. And, you know, it got 10,000 views, 20,000 views, whatever. But it was more that people in the class started networking personally. These Burmese students and their friends, they contacted all their Burmese friends in uh, Virginia Tech, who contacted all their friends in Virginia, who contacted all their relatives and some of them parents who worked in DC, one of which who was a lobbyist for uh, uh, Burmese justice, 
who contacted all their people in the Beltway, who then contacted people over in Burma, and within 48 hours, this lady had seen this video, had seen this video and agreed to it. She's like, well, of course I'll, I'll, of course I'll Skype with your class. That is the power of having a community. I did nothing. I didn't even have the idea on that one. And that is what happens when you have a, an engaged community of people who are doing stuff on their own because they're excited about the content or the process or whatever. And she ended up Skyping with us on a big screen. Uh, and that was a class where people walked out of, some people out, walked out in tears saying that was the greatest thing I've ever witnessed in my life. Uh, from an intro level geography course for something that happened that I had nothing to do with. That's community. That's the power of community. Uh, and it, it creates lifelong learners. I think that's what we're all about. And I'll end with this. Uh, there is some catches here. Uh, mostly this whole community thing, it's an absolute ton of work. It, and uh, it doesn't come naturally. It's kind of like love. You can do everything I just said. And you may not form a community in your class. Uh, just like love. You may know two people who are perfect for each other, and they're both single, and they're both looking to get married, and you set them up on a blind date, and you put them together with a big bottle of wine. That assures nothing. That, uh, that no connection may be made, and the same is true with trying to create a community. The more it appears coerced or forced, the less likely it is to happen. So I can't make people want to be happy about this class. I can't make them talk to each other. I can't make them interact. All I can do is put the tools in place and encourage it, see if it blossoms. Uh, I think we've had success with this mostly for number. I won't lie, mostly because of numbers, because we have so many people that even if 10% participate, that's 300 people who do this stuff. That's a good number. Uh, if you have a class of 30 and 10% participate, well, that's three, if my math is right. So it's, it can be more challenging with smaller classes, but I still think it's a valuable, valuable tool that you should attempt to cultivate if you want your classes to last. And I'll end on that more dire note. I think if people keep teaching the same way they've been teaching for the last 500 years of Western education, I don't think they're gonna last because somebody teaches the class better than you, somebody's gonna teach it online before you, and so people are gonna figure out, ah, someone already has your notes, someone already has your test, somebody already so if you're not doing something to engage my brain with this material, I'll take somebody else's class or I'll scam my way through yours. Sorry, I should, leave, I should end on a higher note. No, but you're all great. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but I think change is inevitable. Uh, and I would just encourage you just to dabble with it, if nothing else, the online office hours. Because these are great tools and it's an exciting time to be in education. I think the whole foundation is getting ready to be ripped down and rebuilt, and I kind of like the idea of rebuilding instead of just kind of letting things fester and saying, well, we'll just keep doing the same thing for another 500 years because that's not going to happen. But thanks for having me. Sorry I kept you over time.